Chris Butler. Um, and uh, what we're going to talk about today is really how do AI teams uh, work together today. And so we did a survey, and I'll take you through some of the high-level findings that were, we found very interesting. Um, how could they work better together than they are today? And then what techniques uh, can you use to actually build better alignment between technical and non-technical people? So I'm from Philosophy. Uh, we're a design consultancy that's based here in New York and Los Angeles. And in particular, we offer uh, help when it comes to strategy around artificial intelligence and the nuance that's involved. Uh, we do hackathon facilitation. If you need to be able to create some space for a couple days uh, within the corporation um, or organization. Uh, we do balance team for AI, which is really how do you quickly ship prototypes that may use off-the-shelf AI or machine learning projects um, to be able to really understand if you should invest long-term in all of the other stuff that you have to do to maintain an AI project. And then design for AI workshops, which we're going to go into a few of the techniques and exercises that we use uh, during those. So first thing is we're uh, releasing a design for AI report, and really the the key aspect of this was when we were asking the question, you know, we, we focus an awful lot on design and how do other people in the industry, both technical and, so say, machine learning engineer um, focused, how do they work with designers and product people? Um, and then also wanted to understand for people that are doing design, how do they work with the engineers and the data scientists? Um, so almost 100 people respond to this uh, kind of cross industry. Again, it's our first time. So um, one of the the, the three takeaways that are very interesting to us, at least, and sorry, this monitor needs to be recalibrated, uh, but uh, one third of AI projects actually don't make it to end users. And while that may sound high, that sounded uh, really high to us, it's actually much higher in the industry. Um, if you look at like IT completion rate or IT release rate, um, data cleanliness and available is really the key to success, right? Like it's something that I think everybody uh, knows that when you're trying to build something like a machine learning model, it's just it's about the data at that point. And then finally, different job roles use different methods to create that alignment with the other side. Um, and I mean that mostly from a technical to non-technical standpoint. And so I'll talk a little bit about what that means. Um, so we wanted to look at all the different factors that may go into um, an AI project in particular. And so we asked people to give us an understanding of either no, no impact to high impact on each one of these uh, particular aspects, and then if they didn't know, that was something that we thought would be very interesting. Um, the very high impact things were, of course, data availability, data cleanliness. Um, we heard data, and there was like data, and this other part, and there was data, and then data, um, and over and over again, it was data all over the survey. Um, so definitely, I, if you go home with one message, data is very important. I think that's what we can all say together. Um, the next thing was actually UX, uh, UI design. So I, I was a little surprised that this was such a high uh, impact in these types of projects, but I, I think that's good to hear, at least, coming from more of a design perspective. Um, what was really controversial, where there was no real agreement between no impact to high impact, um, was really this idea of like false positive or negatives. So how do people deal with that uh, within their machine learning systems? Um, the latest research uh, kind of Again, it was one of those things where some people really thought it was very important, other people didn't think it was important at all. Um, and then worst case outcomes. So what, you know, related a little bit to the false positive negatives, but really what happens if the machine learning uh, algorithm makes really bad recommendations or does something that would be potentially catastrophic if you're talking about more uh, kind of important aspects of it. Um, and then the very end, uh, as far as the unknowns. So people didn't really know what they should do or how much impact things like trust bias or the non-deterministic behavior of these systems. Um, so that's all very interesting to us. Um, we then also ask people, you know, we, we always ask, like, what do you use to make your projects great? And we also ask the three wishes, like, what would you, if I gave you three wishes, what would you change about your uh, process or your systems? Um, and the consensus, again, was data. Um, I didn't say that earlier. I think I said that earlier. But, um, uh, there was a need for more case studies, so how people actually can put these things into practice. Um, not just necessarily from like, oh, here's a uh, Jupyter notebook to be able to learn how to do a CNN, for example. It's more like, how do I actually implement this in a real business um, was something that people wanted more of. And then finally, communication. So 
Um, there's definitely a lot around how people talk to each other uh, when it comes to from a technical side or a, a non-technical side. And so technical side, a lot of focus on kind of, again, the technicals of machine learning algorithms, so all raw curves, uh, precision recall, that type of stuff. Um, whereas the design side was thinking more in, in line of kind of prototypes, user research, um, customer interviews. Um, and so there's, there's definitely a gap there, there's a divide. Um, but that communication aspect was talked about an awful lot. It's just, I think sometimes maybe uh, we're not always speaking the same language. Um, and this was my favorite uh, quote from the entire survey, which is in one team, they just don't allow engineers to use uh, AI terms. So uh, having to put things into the terms of regular language was very helpful for the non-technical people. I'm sure it was a little bit of a struggle for the people that are technical that really live and breathe that type of stuff. Um, but but that, was, that was probably the most interesting. And so now I'd like to jump into um, since we're saying that communication is really important, we're saying this cross-team alignment is really important, how do we actually create the right place for that type of feedback to happen, for that type of communication to happen? Um, and so one of the first ways we think about this is what we'll call empathy mapping for the machine. Uh, and these are all exercises that we've used uh, with engagements, and I'll talk about stories about that. So empathy mapping, if you're not familiar, uh, actually, how many people have done empathy mapping before? Okay. Um, so this is, basically straight up stolen from uh, design thinking, right? So um, it's, it's generally a path towards personas. It's something that you build with other people on the team. Um, and it's a lot about the assumptions that you and the team have about those people. Um, and that's usually a starting point. Once you start to create proto personas and then personas, you're actually refining it with the research. So as you learn more about people's pains or um, other things, you, you, you update this, this model or this assumption set. Um, and then for the machine, it's actually not about personifying it. It's not about giving it a name or anything like that necessarily. Um, it's really about how does it interact with humans? What, is, what are we expecting mirrored back to us when it comes to interaction with that uh, machine learning algorithm or that AI system? Um, and we do this again to create that shared model and to co-create it. So we'll include people that are both technical and non-technical because they'll all bring different aspects or understandings or assumptions or needs uh, to that table when they're discussing this. Um, and then, you know, I think you want to really be answering important questions about what you actually need to go off and build or test from an assumption standpoint, um, both from a te technical standpoint as well as, you know, user research. Um, so this is our empathy map. There's lots of different empathy maps that are out there. Some of them have three. I think the original Cooper empathy map had three areas. Um, we have five because five is better than three. Um, and so uh, the way we think about this is we break it up into really five uh, five segments. And so the first one is does, right? And so in the case of the machine, it's really how does it interact with the world? You know, does it automatically make decisions to do something? Does it update a database? Um, does it slam on the brakes if it's an autonomous vehicle? Um, and these are any of the actions that it could take. Um, so there could be a huge list of these things. Um, in the case that I'm going to be talking about a lot or referring to a lot is we did a project with uh, PwC around field service operations. And if you're not familiar, familiar with that, is field service operations are basically uh, repair people that have to go on site to repair something. And so there will be a dispatcher that helps organize all that work. There will be uh, field techs that are out there doing the stuff, driving to the site, actually doing the repairs. There will be warehouses involved, executives, um, senior field techs. There's a lot of different people that are involved in this. But we really focused a lot on the relationship of how we can help the dispatcher as well as the field tech, and then dabbled in some of the other aspects. So in this case, um, being able to automatically assign a field tech if a job is perceived to be ready for assignment is something that generally a human would do. They would know, um, you know, that I have the problem description, I have the right amount of parts on a certain truck. All these different things will make it then take the action to go and assign that job to someone. So it's in their work here. Senses um, is what does it really need to understand about the world? So this could be something as simple as just a database that it needs to check information about a customer, um, but it could be video, it could be really anything. Um, what does it need to understand about the world um, to be able to do its job well? Um, and so in our case, uh, the actual field tech's truck inventories, which they would hold about $100,000 with equipment on. Um, this was all for like gas station repair, by the way. I don't know if uh, any of this matters. But uh, basically, they would have these huge inventories of parts just on their truck carrying around. And they would have it as part of their warehousing system. So being able to understand who had the right parts was very important, along with, you know, if a field tech had the right certifications, uh, things like that. 
What it says, um, and I actually just did a talk about trust uh, just about an hour and a half ago, um, but how do you actually build trust from the standpoint of the machine, the system itself, with the human operators? Um, and so a lot of that is around communication, right? It could be explaining what it's doing. It could be helping the human interpret the results of its prediction. Um, it could be a lot of different things. And so in our case, uh, we were really thinking about when a tech is automatically assigned, it has a bunch of reasons why it probably chose that tech. And it could be scheduling, it could be certification, it could be inventory, it could be any number of reasons uh, that would be appropriate. So in this case, communicating that very clearly to the dispatcher, um, not only build trust, like I understand why this decision is happening, um, but could also allow them to intervene if they needed to. Thinking. Um, this, the way I think about this is that it's really, if this system is born into the world, what does it have to know that is just the reality of the world? So what are the constraints, right? And I, I think a lot of the time that will be heuristics from experts, right? What's the starting point from this? from how this job actually needs to get done. Um, but it could also be legalities. Um, so in the case of autonomous vehicles, it could be both the heuristic of the rules of the road that people follow, and it could actually be legitimately the driving code that are the actual laws of the world. Both of those things are something that this autonomous vehicle would need to know about. Um, and in this case, uh, it was really that if they're not certified for a particular job, they just can't do the work. Um, partially because of unions, partially because of uh, things like electrical code and, and that type of thing. Fields. Um, so this gets to what is really good and bad performance. And for machine learning or AI people, this is really that like optimization function. And my, um, what's the outcome that I'm really going for? And how, how am I going to actually use this information to train the machine learning algorithm or the ensemble of algorithms to do a better job? Um, and so the one that was really key for field service operation people was uh, return trips. And so minimizing the number of times, so if someone had to go back again, it, usually because they didn't have a part, they didn't have the experience or the capability to fix the issue, they didn't know what the issue was before they got out there, it was a very, very powerful uh, thing to optimize against. So generally, uh, this is what a board will look like. Um, you don't have to draw the robot face if you don't want to, but people enjoy it. <laughs> Um, so generally, you draw this grid on a board, right? Um, and so uh, you draw the grid on the board, um, you announce each section, you make sure people understand what each section is. You should also talk about the prompt um, that you're actually giving them. Uh, generally, this works best after you know a lot about the problem space, um, so that everybody you know, generally is starting to be immersed in the, the world of this problem. Um, and being able to do this, uh, you then privately ideate. Um, and what that means is that you are by yourself uh, quietly writing on sticky notes uh, items for each one of those sections. And then, um, and that's the diverge, if you're familiar with design thinking, it's really the diverge case of this. Then you put them all up on the board, um, you deduplicate, so if concepts are similar, you, you, you can also affinitize if you want to start to group them. Um, but you do that for all the sections. And at the very end, um, as a group, you help identify through what's called dot voting, um, which is where you basically put either just like a pen mark and you get, you trust people, you just give them a pen, you tell them to do 10, mark, 10, mark, 10 marks. Um, they do have stickers that are built for this specifically. Um, we also have a tool called dot, called dot Voter App, if you ever want to try it, uh, dotvoterapp.com, um, which shows really good for remote teams. And so uh, you then dot vote the most important things, and you essentially have a prioritized list that based on this cross-team assembly of people, what really matters for this machine learning algorithm or for the system that will employ artificial intelligence. Um, that's another, uh, this was actually from the NYC Media Lab Summit that we did, and so we did basically like a five hour um, problem to plan set of workshops, um, and empathy mapping was one. So out of this, you have that prioritized set of kind of needs. It's not exactly a spec, right? I, I wouldn't go that far, but it's more like, what are the things we need to start spiking from a technical standpoint? Where do we need to start looking for data? <laughs> you know, how do we know that like we are actually meeting some outcome? Um, and then uh, I think the, probably the most important part, though, is really that consensus between the team. Right? You use terms that are hopefully available to everybody. You discuss this. You talk about prioritization. But it's, again, you've done it together. You know, engineers, data scientists, uh, product people, designers, even executives or customers potentially um, all together. The next thing um, is something where you coined the term confusion mapping. Um, but as you probably can guess, it's based off the confusion matrix. 
And a confusion matrix is something, again, that we stole from data science and statistics. Um, and it's really used to visualize a little bit more about the performance of an algorithm. Um, and in this case, uh, when we say predicted, it's what the machine learning algorithm thought would happen. And then actual was, what is the ground truth as you understand it? It doesn't always mean you always understand the real truth, but at least whatever you think is the real truth. Um, and so in the, um, and, yeah, actually, I'm just gonna go to this because Google actually did a really great job with like a little animation here. Um, but the things that you usually care about are really the true positives and the true negatives, right? Because that's, you classify it correctly. So it was supposed to take an action, and it did take an action. Or it wasn't supposed to take an action, and it didn't take an action. Those are really usually the most important things. And if you think back to the empathy mapping, you were looking at those things in the field section of the empathy map. What we're missing, though, is what happens if I actually think I should do something, but I shouldn't. And I think I shouldn't do something, but I do. Um, and that's called false ne negative and false positive. And so maybe bring this back to, say, autonomous vehicles. The false positive is where, let's say, I'm trying to detect people in front of my car. Uh, the false positive is that I think there's someone in front of my car, and there's not actually, but I slam on my brakes. Right? And that's kind of annoying for the person that's in the car. The false negative is that I don't think anybody's in front of me, and so I just run over someone. That's pretty bad. Um, so you start to understand, uh, you know, and it doesn't always have to be in that direction either. It could be that a false negative where I don't detect something like cancer in a cardiology report, that could be bad, um, and vice versa. So, you know, again, why do we do this? This is because these systems do fail, and they will fail. Like, they absolutely will. Um, and so we need to know what does that mean for the people using it? What are the outcomes that are not necessarily just like the really good outcome that we're trying to plan for? Um, and I would say also, you know, accuracy, things like that, that's helpful to a certain extent, but it doesn't tell you maybe, um, you know, specific problems that will be, uh, that will be identified here. Um, it does help ident identify or discover really worst case situations. Um, and again, starts that discussion between uh, different team roles uh, based on this information. Um, so what we do is we first draw, of course, we always draw on a whiteboard. Um, so, uh, and then um, we privately ideate the false positive and false negatives. Um, you can also do the true positives and true negatives. I've just found that if you've done the empathy mapping, you kind of know what those are already. Um, and then as a group, you can, uh, once you've done all of them, uh, you place them on the board. Uh, you then uh, dot vote to stack rank for severity. Um, and uh, this is more of a conversation. Right? And, and what you're supposed to be getting out of this, in particular, is that not only do you have kind of what are the worst case scenarios, but you understand that which ones are, is the organization willing to live with if it happens. And so in the case of the false negative, where I just run someone over, that's an example of where either we need to take specific action to train our model to be better at that particular case, or we need to start to think about how we build ensembles of models, or how we actually just do hard-coded logic to override those types of things, which also adds its own technical debt around machine learning, but that's that's really what we're trying to understand in this particular exercise. The last one I want to talk about is role planning. Um, and so because a lot of the time, uh, these types of systems are going to be not only interacting you know, uh, with a human in the loop or a machine in the loop, however you want to talk about that, it's not just that loop, but it's actually how does it exist within the larger <coughs> Um, how does that actually exist in the larger context of the organization where there's not only just one person and one machine, but there's many people talking to many machines that are then talking to people. And so role playing is one of those things that uh, you can use to help get a better understanding of how that interaction should actually take place. And I don't mean this type of role playing, although I do use dice to make decisions sometimes. Um, it's stolen from service design, this type of role playing. Um, Usually service design people tend to use a lot more cardboard and build a lot of big structures. Uh, but you don't have to do that. Um, each person assumes a particular role or a behavior, or in this case, a, a machine or a service or something like that. Um, you can use costumes or props. Um, and then there's also uh, other versions of this that are more focused on, say, board games. Um, but the reason why you want this type of thing is that you can, one, experience what it may be like to be in that situation. And then two, it the idea of kind of play in this sense allows you to have a much more honest conversation about the way these things work. Um, and yeah, again, that the interaction between people and machines are important to understand, especially those issues that may come up. And you'll you'll actually come across them um, if you try to do them. And the, the feedback is visceral because you're doing it right then. Um, so this is an example. I don't know if 
this is going to work. But. So, request for a proposal. I, I really don't need a proposal. I don't want to waste your time. Um, all right. Can I just shoot you an email or something? Is there an email anywhere? Okay. Um, all right. Contact person. Uh, that's me, right? I'm all. My name? I guess that's my name. I mean, how often do people actually fill out this for other people? And usually, the person. Who, okay. Anyway, I'll fill. All right. I'll fill out my name. Enough. For <laughs> so, in that example, they used to prop up like a browser screen, and this was, I think, from you know maybe ten years ago or something like that. But I think the the case still. You know, it was, it was very understandable that this particular forum was not doing the human any favors in that case. The human couldn't ask questions, they couldn't understand more, they didn't get any affordances for why they should get this information. Um, and so, anyways, you do have to kind of play act a little bit, as you can tell there. Um, yeah, so, um, how do you do this? Usually, a little bit of prep work is required, so you want to put together all the different systems or agents. Um, there's another exercise from soft, soft systems methodology called Rich Picture. So I'm not going to go over in this, but that's a way to understand the kind of complex network of agents and organizations. Um, but once you have kind of that small set, so in our case, it, it, it would have been dispatchers, field techs, maybe the warehouse, the warehouse system, maybe this dispatcher website and the mobile app for the field tech, right? And so there's some interesting things that start to happen there, especially when the app for the field tech has to talk to the dispatcher's app, which then has to talk to the dispatcher. Um, so you give out these things. Uh, if you have personas, that's also a great starting point. Um, you give out the roles to each person. They should study them a little bit, maybe for five minutes. But you don't want to give anything away quite yet. Um, and if there's specific instructions about how they can interact, um, that's very important here. You then give a prompt. Um, usually it's some person taking action, but it could be a machine uh, waking up and doing something. Um, and then start role playing. And then what's really key, really key after this is to do what I would consider a retrospective, right? And generally, in a retrospective, what I use is you know what went well, what didn't go well, and what we can do better next time. So spending you know five to ten minutes of each one of those things will give you an awful lot of information about how that particular scenario played out, um, how to improve it, things like that. Um, and so yeah, now you have a little bit more empathy, ideally, uh, for the people that are going to be in this interaction, um, and then a list of notes. Um, and you can now go off and uh, take the next thing, either build another prototype uh, to work with people, actually build out a, pro you know, a more um, kind of in-depth prototype with the system, things like that. And so my, my final thought is really just that we should continue to talk like humans to each other <laughs> to build things for other humans. And so um, I hope that I've been able to show you a couple techniques you can use with your teams. Thank you.